Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Kidlet Social presented by Children's Book Insider. I almost said Kidlet Distancing Social, but we dropped the distancing last week. We are now just the Kidlet Social. Another change I want to remind you of. Uh, this is going to be our last social for July. We are gone the rest of the Tuesdays this month. Starting in August, we will be going to just twice a month. The first and third Tuesdays of every month will be the social. And I did it that way. So it's easy to remember first and third Tuesdays, you'll still get our emails. We'll put them on the Facebook page, etc. I have some great guests lined up all the way into October already. So stick with us and I hope to see you those uh, two Tuesdays every month. But since things are opening up, people are getting busy. Uh, I thought that this was appropriate. We can keep in touch, but I don't monopolize your time every week like we did during the pandemic. <laughs> but thanks for being with me during all those Tuesdays. If you are brand new to the social and you want to get on our list about everything that's happening, please go to writeforkids.org forward slash ultimate dash cheat sheet. You will get a free ebook. Uh, where we have compiled 31 years of knowledge of getting started in children's books into one ebook that is your gift for get, putting putting your email on our list and then we'll let you know about everything we do not just the social but all the other stuff we do any other fun things we have coming up you'll be on our list to get notified of all of that if you want to subscribe to children's book insider which is our flagship product celebrating its 31st year in business this year, you can go to writeforkids.org forward slash CBI. We have a special $5 a month deal just for our socialites. 20 pages a month of newsletter delivered to your inbox, along with a special above the slush code every month for either an editor or an agent where you can jump over the slush pile and submit to them with our special code and access to our CBI Clubhouse, which is an online database of 31 years worth of information, um, as, as well as back issues. So that's awesome. So writeforkids.org forward slash CBI. Now we celebrate, woohoo! I have a good one tonight. PJ McElvain, our, one of our Children's Book Insider contributors who provides all our awesome author interviews, has revealed the cover by Logan Rogers of her new picture book, Dragon Roar, to be published by McLaren Cochrane Publishing on October 19th. Also, she just announced a three book deal with Young Dragons Press for her Critters series, which will debut in 2023. So PJ, that is awesome. Congrats on that. Very great accomplishments. And as you see, we only have the most talented people contributing to our newsletter. So I wanna hear from you, send us your good news. Uh, email mail at writeforkids.org and put celebrate in the subject line and we will feature you on a future Kidlet Distancing Social. And no celebration is too small. Last week we had some great celebrations of critique partners found and great mentor texts that had been discovered. Anything like that, we're going to celebrate with you because every step along the journey is important. So I want to hear from you. And especially if I'm not going to do this until August, I better have a lot of celebrates in my email between now and then. And I have something to celebrate. On Thursday of this week, whoops, we are uh, presenting a webinar with Lionel Bender, How to Get Published with Book Packagers. And this is great. This is going to be such an amazing webinar. Uh, for those of you who may have uh, taken a bunch of our webinars in the past, Lionel did one several months ago on writing for the school and library market, which was amazing. Lionel Bender is a book packager. He's a partner with Bender Richardson White, 
uh, which has published over a thousand books for publishers, both in the UK and the US. And he is going to tell you how to connect with book packagers and how they are a great untapped market for writers. If you don't know what a book packager is, they produce books and series, most often series for publishers. Often publishers might not have the staff or the resources to create a series, but they want a series. Uh, a lot of it is nonfiction. And so they hire a book packager to do the series for them. The packagers find the authors, the illustrators, they edit it, they design it, they print it with the publisher's name on it. The publisher sells the book. Um, also, book packagers uh, conceive and create series and then go and sell those to publishers. So it's a great opportunity. Bit.ly forward slash book packagers will take you to the place where you can register for this webinar. It's 47 bucks. It's going to be about an hour and a half of information plus Q&A plus a takeaway PDF. It's a great deal. And yes, it will be recorded. If you can't attend live, you will get the recording. So that's this Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Okay. Let me see if... Oh, Melissa signed up earlier today. Yay. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. Lionel is really good. He knows his stuff. Okay. Links of interest. Here's a great one. Harness Social Media to Sell Books by Stephen Spatz on the Book Baby blog. Give some practical tips for wrapping your arms around promoting your book on social media. And here's the direct link, bit.ly forward slash book baby social media. Trust me, all the more obvious links were taken. Um, so I know you all hate the idea of social media and marketing your books, but it's a reality of the business. And this is a really great sort of primer to tell you how to sort of organize your time, not be so intimidated by the idea of marketing because it's really what you're, it's, they, Stephen says, it's social media. You are being social with your audience, which is exactly the right way to think about it. And this is part of a series on marketing. So you can go to this blog and find the other posts and it might give you some great tips if you are getting ready to market your book. Okay. Now I get to introduce my guest. Nathan Bransford is the author of The Writing Guides, How to Write a Novel and How to Publish a Book, and the middle grade uh, trilogy, Jacob Wonderbar, Jacob Wonderbar trilogy from Dial Books. He's formerly a literary agent with Curtis Brown and started blogging in 2007. And his blog has consistently been named one of the 101 best websites for writers by Writer's Digest. And if you attend this social regularly, you know that I agree because I often add his posts in my links of interest um, segment because I think his writing advice is spot on. He's dedicated to helping authors write what they love navigate the publishing process and successfully market their books. And you can go to his website, nathanbransford.com to learn about his editing services, as well as see all of his books and find his blog, One Stop Shopping. So Nathan, come on. Hello everybody. Hi, thanks for being here. And thanks for waiting a little bit while we let people filter in from our email glitch <laughs> no, that's good information yeah. yeah it's great to see people from all over too it's really cool it is we always get a great crowd from all over the world which is really fun and then we have even more watching on the replay so um nice. we are we are quite an international social group here i'm very proud of that <laughs> <laughs> so um we're going to talk about hooks tonight i mean we could talk about lots of stuff but that's going to be one of our focuses because this is something that writers hear all the time when they go to writing conferences or they attend webinars, editors and agents often say, we're looking for stuff with a hook. And then writers email me and go, what is that? And so we're gonna, I'm gonna have you tell them tonight. <laughs> Which well, is I great. Mean, 
Yeah. I mean, the funny thing about hooks is that you'll ask people in the business, like, well, what's your definition of a hook? And yeah. everyone has a slightly different answer. I wish yes. there were a universal definition of hook, but I, I think you can kind of break down the answers into two broad camps. Some people, when they say a hook, they, they just mean like what's, what's unique about a book or, or especially a novel's plot. Um, and so you need to have, you need to be able to articulate what your story is, what makes your book unique. Um, some, some people though mean something more high concept, uh, something that could be kind of pitched in a very pithy one line summary, like snakes on a plane or Sharknado or like the classic yeah. high concept um, um, storylines. Um, so I, 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 I'm a little bit more of the former because I don't think you have to have a high concept plot but you should know what makes your novel unique. You should, you should have some kind of a hook that you can kind of articulate to, 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 to describe your book. Mm -hmm. So unique means specific too, right? You can't yeah, exactly. Just, it's a rhyming bedtime story. Right, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I often hear pitches that are along the lines of, or hooks that are along the lines of, you know, it's a it's a coming of age novel about this this boy who goes on some adventures and learns about himself. And it's like, okay, that doesn't that doesn't mean anything. It could be that could be applied to just about any any novel that, with a boy in it. Um, and so it's the specificity and the specific flavor that you bring to bear to describe the specific details that really is going to make your book sound interesting and, and stand out. Yeah, and also what you just said there, you were describing themes, coming of age, learns about himself, and really the hook is plot and character specific. It's the yeah, bring those it's, themes to life. Exactly, it's what happens in the novel, and that that's the it's, it's you know stay away from themes, stay away from uh, from what you book think the book means, and mm -hmm. orient more towards what happens, and so. When I'm when I'm advising people on how to craft a one sentence pitch, um, basically the, the, there's a there's a pretty good formula that will get you pretty close to where you need to be, which is essentially um, when the inciting incident happens. So insert whatever happens that kicks off your story. Uh, when that happens, your character or characters have to overcome a really big obstacle in order to complete their goal or complete their quest. Mm -hmm. Quests can be in inner journeys. They can be uh, exterior journeys, they can be literal quests, they can be more metaphorical quests, but that's the formula. When X happens, the character does X, Y, and Z in order to get to the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And that also kind of gives us the, uh, that in, in our writing blueprints, we I have a version of that that I call the storyline, and it's sort of it gives people a, a something to hang the plot off of. They know mm -hmm. here's where I've started, here's where I'm going. Mine has a completion of you know what's standing in their way, but but that's great. So that also helps point you toward the hook. And again, mm -hmm. if those things aren't real specific or unique, it's going to be just a very ordinary story. Yeah, yeah, those great, absolutely. So, um, what if the manuscript doesn't have a hook? If, if the author can't identify a hook in their manuscript. So I, I, I think pretty much any book can be distilled down uh, to, to one sentence. Um, it, it may not sound like the most scintillating one sentence that you've ever read. I was thinking of some books that aren't very high concept that are very successful. And so I was thinking about like Looking for Alaska or thinking by John Green or I was thinking about Gilead. And th those books are so much more about the voice and the story and, yes. and the um, and uh, and distilling those down into a, a one pithy one sentence summary isn't going to make it sound um, completely amazing, but but it's still useful to do that and to have a, a, a solid one sentence. I recommend a one sentence, one paragraph, and two paragraph version of your of your hook or your your pitch, um, just because people are gonna you're gonna go through life and people are gonna ask you what your book is about, mm -hmm. and sometimes you need to just be able to like rattle it off, and sometimes you have a little bit more time you can get into a little bit more, but. When people ask you what your book is about, whether it's someone in an elevator or a publishing professional, they don't they don't really want like a 10 minute download on, on every yeah. as you kind of meander through a, a plot description. And um, especially if you when you go through the publishing process, people are constantly asking you for summaries, like quick, quick kind of sound bites. You, you get interviewed and people want to you need to be able to speak to what your book's about. Um, and so, yeah, it's not easy to do, but I think it's a really ne necessary and useful exercise. Mm -hmm. 
when you are uh, putting your hook in the query letter, first of all, is it is this what you should start your query letter off with? Is the hook right up front? So I, I've been seeing this a little bit more, and I think that there is some advice out there that is advising people to do this. I personally associate kind of an opening log line more with the movie business than I do with book publishing. Yeah. And when people, when I used to be, I used, when I used to be a literary agent, um, I I didn't like it because I had to start the story twice because you get a one line summary mm -hmm. about the about the story, and then you start over with a plot description. And, um, mm -hmm. and I I. I I personally think unless you specifically see an agent in your research who likes high concept storylines or wants a wants a log line or something along those lines, um, I think the default should just be a really solid two to three paragraph plot description. Um, and that's very specific, that, that stays away from those vague phrases, that stays away from those themes. And your your hook and what makes your um, your story unique should be infused into the plot description. Okay. And within that, the editor will know or the agent what genre it is, if it's fantasy, sci-fi, anything like that. And then as far as the age group, is that something if you if it's not obvious from your synopsis, would you then under the synopsis say this is a chapter book for ages six six to nine? Kind of yeah. Thing. So, so the essential structure of a query letter is first, I'd recommend opening with some personalization to show the agent that you research them individually. Um, you don't, you don't need to go on and on about an agent, but just it, it tips off the agent. You've done your research and you chose them individually. You didn't blast off the same letter to hundred people. Um, mm -hmm. So opening personalization two to two or three paragraph plot summary, um, a summary of the nuts and bolts of, of the book, including the title, uh, word count, genre, um, in, in, any comps you want to include, um, which which is optional, but some agents do care about that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I'm forgetting something. Oh, and and whether you think it could potentially be a series, it's, a, it's a, um, just another discussion for another day. But but it should, the first book should stand alone. And then a brief bio, and that bio can include publishing credits. If you're writing a novel, it doesn't have to. It's really just a brief time to just kind of give the agent a sense of who you are. It's just nice to, for an agent to kind of just, you know, get a sense of you. Um, mm -hmm. And that's it. That's the essential structure of a query letter. Okay. What about nonfiction? You know, nonfiction is getting so creative uh, now. Does nonfiction need a hook as well of some sort? Yeah, definitely. And so for nonfiction, um, for, for narrative nonfiction, things like his, like historical or biography or, or, or memoir, the rules are a little bit more like novels where there's, there's, there's like an arc to it. You can, you can kind of speak to it, use the, some of the same formulas for, um, um, as, as for fiction. And then for more prescriptive nonfiction, it's really kind of the key selling point of the of the um of the book and so you know a lot of times that's also can be high concept like the, i remember that book the cures that they don't want you to know about things like that um but it's whatever it is it's the key key, key selling point that you kind of wrap into the 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 pitch mm -hmm. great now suppose you dream of writing a high concept book uh it, the difference again to kind of define that is uh apart from just hook in general this is something where again it's it's like in one sentence you immediately know sharknado right well <laughs> right and is it something that lends itself well to becoming a movie or a tv show is that sort of dramatic visual element important in high concept so it's, a, I mean, it's a good starting place. And then as we all know from a lot of different high cap concept storylines, some are more successful than others. And so, um, you know, like I, I would say that Jurassic Park was more successful execution than let's say Sharknado, no offense to the filmmakers. Um, sure. and, um, and so, um, so same with, same with novels. I mean, I, I wouldn't kind of, there, I think there are a couple of risks. One is that sometimes when people have a really high concept idea that they love they kind of get very very attached to that idea and ideas in are kind of a dime a dozen they're like lots of people have good ideas for novels it's it's the, an idea and a one sentence pitch is not what's going to make your book successful or sell your book um it's the execution and how how strong you actually make the the book and so 
Um, I wouldn't get too beholden to the to any high concept plot because I see it all. I saw it all the time when I was working in the business where books were come out all the time that were relatively similar. One would take off, one would maybe wouldn't, mm -hmm. um, and and um, and it has a lot more to do with um, with execution than anything else. Sure, sure. Yeah, publishing seems to be great at jumping on the bandwagon when there's one success, then it's like, we need five more. <laughs> yeah, so there, there, there is some of that, but also sometimes it's just the zeitgeist and, and things true. just happen yeah. to simultaneously be percolating. I remember even before Twilight came out, I was I noticed I was getting a million query letters about vampires and I didn't I couldn't didn't know why, but there was something percolating in the zeitgeist. Yeah. And so um yes, and then but then yes, sometimes publishers will, will also chase what's what's relatively successful. But bear in mind that that you know publishing decisions are made a year or two out. And so mm -hmm. capitalizing on something that's already successful is it's a slow process to try and do that. So yeah. um it's a little bit of both. Yeah. So if you want to make sure that your manuscript has a hook, at what point in the writing process should you be thinking about that? Should it be at the idea stage when you're really conceiving of the story? Is that the easiest time to know if you have a hook? Or do you wait till your first draft is written and then go back? What What is your advice? Yeah, I think it really just varies from person to person. And I wouldn't quite sweat it if you don't know your, your hook right off the bat. If you do have one and you're starting from a, a place of a, of a strong hook, that's great. Just make sure that you're really focusing on the execution. And mm -hmm. if you don't and you're just writing and you don't know where it's going and you don't know how it's going to fit together, like that's okay too. I've seen every everyone on the spectrum from from you know writing an entire book, not really knowing where it's going, and then revising later to people who basically write perfect first drafts and are super careful and super outlined and super super vigilant and, and know where it's going to go. Um, and it's okay. Like there's, there's no one way to do it. Just know who you are as a writer, kind of embrace that. And, mm -hmm. um, but just know that you do have to do it at some point, no matter what. I think people sometimes talk themselves out of needing to pitch because they're, they're a writer, you know, you write novels, someone else's job to do the pitch. That's why you have an agent. But mm -hmm. like, if you go through the process, you're constantly, constantly, constantly pitching as the, as the author. And so don't shy away from that responsibility, embrace it, get good at pitching. It's part of the process. Um, and so, um, whether you start with, with the, with the pitch or whether you finish it, um, you, you gotta, you gotta do it at some point. Um, for me, for, for my, for my novels, uh, for the Jake, for Jacob Wonderbar, I was literary agent at the time, but even still, I, I really didn't sit down to write the query letter until I was done. Um, I, I, I kind of roughly knew my pitches. I had them kind of in, in my head, but. I didn't write them down until I was done. I don't know if I was just being superstitious about it or what, but um, so yeah, it's you don't have to start with them. Sure. Well, and I think what's interesting, a lot of authors don't realize the acquisitions process is not just the editor saying, I love this, I'm gonna send you a contract. They have to essentially sell the book to a bunch of people at the publishing house who sign off on it and, it, and they have to, all these departments have to figure out if they can make money on the book. So the sales yeah. department weighs in, the art department, uh, marketing, everybody. And so that pitch is important because your editor is going to use it when they go to the editorial meeting and tell everyone else about the book. And then, um, you know, the, the sales department might use a form of it when they are pitching the book to the bookstores and, you know, book buyers, that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. And, and again, if there's nothing unique about your particular execution, how are they going to pitch your book? Yeah, abs absolutely. And, and it, so there are other others, others in that mix too. So, so for instance, um, your agent will write a letter that is our, with your submission when they submit it to the, to the, to the editors in the first place, and they may draw upon your query letter and your pitch, mm -hmm. um, in order to craft that. Um, same for film, um, you know, is if your if your book's being being pitched for for book to film, um, you know, you might be providing um, a, a summary to to a film agent. Um, so it's super it's super important to get to get good at this skill and uh, mm -hmm. and don't don't and I also don't recommend um, kind of outsourcing it because you you know the magic of your book, you know what makes it special. It's your voice. I, mm -hmm. I, I I'm often approached by authors who want me to write a, read their book and write their query letter for them. But like, I can't, I can't capture your magic in your pitch. And mm -hmm. so I take embrace the responsibility. Uh, and don't don't shy away. Right.
Yeah. And it, it can be intimidating because you're like, I have to, I have to summarize my book in a paragraph. I have to pull out what makes it great. Um, but it is just a matter of practice and take it to your critique group, especially if they're familiar with the manuscript and ask them if, if you've actually captured it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an art form in, in itself. Yeah, sure. it definitely is. And it takes practice. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, remember you can ask Nathan anything. So put some questions in the Q and a, um, you've got a great, uh, expert here on lots of areas of writing. So let's take advantage of this opportunity. <laughs> um, so when you were creating your Jacob Wonderbar series, um, how did you conceive of that series? Were you thinking about a hook when you were coming up with the idea? Yeah, so I, I started with something that was hook-ish. My, my very first idea was, um, I was just, I can't, I, did, I don't remember quite what I was doing, but I just had this idea of this kid who is trapped on a planet full of substitute teachers. And that's where substitute te teachers come from. And he, he was uh, kind of a good hearted troublemaker. And that's, that's what I started with and for, the, for an, and then it eventually became an entire series. And so um, that is a little bit high concept, but it wasn't, I, I didn't want that to be the whole thing. And so I, um, I kind of just kept asking questions like, well, how did he get there? Who, is he, who did he go to space with? What happened on the way? And eventually I arrived at a story of, you know, he's, um, he's, he's a, you know, trouble, troublemaker with a heart of gold who has two friends. Um, they trade a corn dog for a spaceship with this mysterious man in silver. They blast off into space. They accidentally break the universe and then they have to find their way back home. Um, and that is the essence of that I, that I was, that I was working with that I worked into my pitch. Um, and so that, that, that became the basis of my one sentence pitch once I, but only when I was finished. So three kids trade a corn dog for a space spaceship, blast it off into space, uh, accidentally break the universe and have to find their way back home. So that's, that's my one sentence pitch. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of had it in mind as I was writing, but, but really I didn't sit down to actually properly write them until I was, mm -hmm. I was finished. Right. But see, just that sentence, when you read that, we can immediately envision, first of all, kind of the tone of the book. Right. And we know that it's going to be action, you know, action based, fast paced, a lot of plot, I imagine. Right. right. And so it's the flavor, right? Trading a corn dog for a spaceship makes it, it make, conveys that it's a bit goofy. It's a, it's a yeah. kind of a screwball adventure. Um, accidentally break the universe is another bit of that of flavor because obviously you can't like break the universe, but that's what they thought they did. Um, and then have to find their way back home is the ultimate quest. Mm -hmm. And so it has those elements of the the, the starting place, the um, the obstacle when breaking the universe is an obstacle, and the completion or the the you know the, the goal of of finding their way back home. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's how, really how I think about pitching. Um, if someone can get that kind of get the, the flavor of the novel plus the essence of the plot in just one sentence. Right, right. And again, the theme of, like you said, finding your way back home um, is something that's been covered in a lot of books because we only have a finite amount of themes that we really write about, but mm -hmm. the execution is what is unique. And that's really what you're, you're focusing on there. Mm -hmm. So that's great. That's great. Um, we have a question here. Do you have a cheat sheet for, you use for revisions or what is your process for revisions? So you're both a writer, you were an agent, you're an editor. Do you approach revisions differently depending on which hat you're wearing? Yeah, definitely. So I, I do have some um, posts on, on my, on my blog about, um, how to, how I approach editing um as a writer um i don't know if i have one i don't think i've quite done one how i approach it as an editor but that's it that would be a good idea for a post maybe i should do that but um but yeah so so how i approach revisions as a writer um is to um assemble the feedback in the, whether it's in the form of margin notes or an editorial letter um and then i i color code the letter um mm -hmm. and i i decide what i'm going to take going to what advice I'm going to take, what I'm um, I'm not going to take, and then um, I kind of group the feedback into into things I know I need to do, and then um, and then I, I I rank them by how difficult the change is going to be and mm -hmm. how expansive because there's when you start changing things there are cascade I call it the cascade effect mm -hmm. cascade effect terror <laughs> um, one thing necessitates ten other changes because to make the storyline still make sense. 
Um, mm -hmm. And so anyway, that's my basic process. I work my way through from, from biggest to smallest and then finishing with line edits. Um, um, and the reason for that is, is if you start with just one, tweaking things on a line level, you might be spending time on something that's going to get swallowed in a much larger revision. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really prioritize from biggest to smallest. But another thing that I have on my blog is, um, is a revision checklist. And it's sort of like questions to ask yourself, some gut checks around, um, you know, around plot, around characters and, and whether you're, you're really and truly um, finished. Mm -hmm. That's great. And when you are, you know, gathering your feedback and deciding what to, which suggestions to implement and which to not implement, how, how, how do you know if someone's feedback is accurate or not or worth following? Yeah. So, um, the, kind of there's three, three groups. One is like, it's so obvious you're going to take it. Right. Um, then there's some that's like, so obviously you're not going to take it. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's, then there's the middle of the ground where I just get mad. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just get mad at the feedback. And, um, and what I, what and I've learned through time that, uh, when I get mad, it means that my editor is right. I just don't want to do it. I'm yeah. just kind of like, my, I'm just like resisting. So those, t those tend end up being, being changes as well. But the thing is, it, with the feedback that you dis, you might dismiss, I think, or even if the ones you think you need to take, really try and get down to what they what the problem is, not like suggestion, not don't listen to suggestions about how to fix things yet. Just even when someone suggests like, hey, you should have like space monkeys in this section, and be like, well, why why is this person recommending space monkeys? That doesn't make sense. Get to the the problem the problem that triggered the suggestion. Right diagnose that problem be like oh this part's just boring or oh it, any more conflict and um, then come up with your own solution so mm -hmm. so so when you're looking at the feedback you get from anybody um don't just jump to accept their fixes diagnose diagnose your your the, the real problem yeah that's great advice that's great advice um let's see what else do we have here um uh, PJ is asking if you miss being an agent. <laughs> so um, that's, a, that's a good question. No, not really. So basically I, I left agenting. I kind of wanted to try different things. I, I just, you know, it was the, my only job. Um, my first job out of college and I just, I don't know, there's a big world out there. I kind of wanted to try something new. And, um, but I really, I really missed the world of books. And, um, and so when I eventually found myself at a hedge fund, when I left the hedge fund, um, I, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had a pretty, pretty interesting journey. Um, I, I, I sort of thought to myself, how can I take everything I liked about being an agent and just do that and make that my job? Um, and so that's what I do now. So basically I, I can help as many writers as I can. Um, I, I'm sorry, I edit, help people edit their manuscrips, edit their query letters, um, help pe people with consultation and give them publishing advice. And so it's all the, the helping without the dealing with publishers and, and negotiating mm -hmm. and all the stuff that I didn't, I didn't care as much for, um, with the job. So I'm super happy now. I feel like I, I, I really kind of was able to, to design a job that took what I liked about agenting and discarded the rest. I did exactly the same thing. I was an agent before I started our newsletter and our write mm -hmm. for kids business. And it was the same thing. I loved mm -hmm. the editorial part. I loved working with the authors, the selling stuff, the negotiating contracts. Yeah, it was okay. But um, yeah, so I did the same thing. I totally relate to that. Yeah. Great. Um, so let's talk about comp titles a little bit. Uh, uh, we have a question here. What is the point of comparing stories to your story to something that's out there? So why are editors always asking for this and agents? And then yeah. how do you find the right ones mm -hmm. for your query? Yeah. So, so the, 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 the thing with comp titles is to kind of give an agent or an editor a sense of the market for the book. And, re, and it's, I would keep that lens in mind. It's about market it's not about storylines. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, it, it, but there's a second component, which is that um, um, it also can help an agent kind of wrap their head around the story if you, if you do it well. 
Um, and so if it's like, you know, Jurassic Park meets the Hunger Games, then you kind of have, you immediately have a sense of like what that would be. Okay. So it's like mm -hmm. kids, you know, competing with dinosaurs in the mix. <laughs> um and and so um but so so it's it's that's that's the thing if you might that you don't even need to like the, the book that you're comparing yours to that might be painful to do if you don't actually like the book but it's really about giving the agent a sense of the potential market and that there's a potential readership for yours mm -hmm. um there most agents i know consider them optional um you don't have to have comp titles if you don't can't think of good ones but increasingly, and also I think with, with, with some younger agents that, that I know, it's more important to them to have them and to, for you to know where your book fits in the market, which I think is as much about knowing that you have the skill set to determine that as it is about um, the specific comp titles you choose. They, they don't necessarily have to be perfect. So the way, the, the way you go about it is to just find um think about your ideal reader or who's you think you're going to read your book and what is that person reading and start there and mm -hmm. it really doesn't take that much time if you just spend a couple of hours on amazon and goodreads and, and googling and finding books that are connected to each other you can probably come up with some books that are in your zone and you think about the mix and match i highly recommend that at least one of the comp titles was was published in the last five years ideally 10 if you can stretch it um because you know you can't i, I don't recommend pitching uh or com comparing your book to things that were published 50 or 75 years ago because it's just it's just a completely different market and this is a, again it's about lens about market not similarities mm -hmm. um and it's okay to include tv shows and movies but i would I, try and include at least also one book so right. book likes and one of the two or three need, needs to be published in the last in the last five years and, and resonate with with the agent because you're writing for today's market you're not writing for the market that existed 75 years ago mm -hmm. alexine asks suppose the agent hates your comps uh there's not much you could do about that <laughs> you don't yeah know. you'll never know yeah you'll never know if they do or not yeah so Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, and agents don't need necessarily. They just need to see the market fit. Like sure. they don't have to love. Like agents should love your book, but like they don't. They're not going to love everything that's out there. Yeah. And I imagine you want you don't you don't want to just pick runaway bestsellers because that's right. That's a, that's another good piece of advice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So household name books like mm -hmm. um, you know Harry Potter, Twilight. Um, you know, but but along those lines, um, even the Hunger Games, I'd be careful with. Um, it, it, where where the crawdad saying, you know what I mean? Like the ones that are like everyone is currently comparing their book to. Um, try and steer clear of those, but do stick to books that are well known. So it's a good, it's kind of a middle ground to strike. Well reviewed, and remember, the agent is going to know these books because they're part part of the industry. So if they're books that are well reviewed. Uh, have won, maybe won some awards, sell well, but they're not necessarily the runaway blockbusters. It's okay. The agents are going to know those titles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see here. Uh, when you're writing your pitch or hook, do you tell the ending of the story or do you just tell them the goal, the obstacle, you know, kind of get the tension going without telling them the ending? Um, so it's not necessary to provide the ending in a pitch or a query letter it is in a synopsis but not in a pitch or a query letter mm -hmm. on the other hand i wouldn't worry about spoilers in a in a query letter um or a pitch um it's more important to to provide enough information so that the agent can wrap their head around the story and so um so don't worry about spoilers um but generally you kind of want to give a sense of the quest usually what people do is give a sense of the quest without saying the actual resolution and so in mind they have to find their way back home it doesn't say that they do or don't um right. that's that's just the quest um but on the other hand um you know i, I again i really can't stress this enough like agents don't get spoiled you know but they spoilers just don't don't matter to agents they, they they're going to read the book like 10 times chances right. are or it actually goes out they're very good at putting themselves in the shoes of someone who hasn't read it before 
Um, so, so don't worry about spoilers with agents and, and plus agents read so much and I, I'm never spoiled anymore. I can see the craft that underlies everything. I am not spoiled. Um, so yeah, so, so, so err on the side of just being clear about what happens. Okay, great. So we have a couple questions about, um, researching publishers and agents to submit to, and then personalizing the query letter. Now, you know, the research process can be you know, I don't expect you to spend 20 minutes explaining that. That's quite lengthy. But um, how do you, you know, little ways to personalize the query at the beginning will be part of your research as you're looking into publishers and agents, correct? Yeah. So basically, like, I recommend creating a spreadsheet that has everything you're going to need. Uh, in fact, if you if you Google my name and, and, and how to research a literary agent, um, I have a whole post that with all these recommendations. Excellent. Um, it includes a spreadsheet that you can download that's a, that will has all the fields that you need, um, sort of, you know, the submission requirements, email address, a Twitter handle, if you find it, books that the other agent, the agent represents. But but really, when it comes to that personalization, keep it just keep it simple, but say something unique. Um, and so I saw your interview and such and such. I saw that you represented so and so. Um, but make sure you're saying something that couldn't be said about another agent. So don't just say because I'm requiring you because you represent middle grade science fiction. Um, say something unique and specific. Um, mm -hmm. Don't overdo it. It's it, it's just a tip off. It's not about kissing up. It's not about becoming the agent's best friend. It's just tipping them off that you did your research. Right. To it. Great, great. Uh, la, 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 la. Let's see here. Irene, this is an interesting question. If your story has magic, how much of that, if any, should you include in the query letter plot description? Well, again, that's to me, that goes to genre, to some of the interesting, unique details. Of the book. And yeah, so I mean, it, I think it's it's hard to say in the abstract, but one one thing to to watch out for is that um, different magical concepts mean different things in different mm -hmm. novels, and so even something like a wizard can mean a lot of different things in in novels, and so don't rest on your assumption of what a wizard means. Really make sure that you're contextualizing this specific flavor and, and what people are actually doing. And so it's, a, it's another push towards specificity rather than just being, being general about magic. And so, you know, mm -hmm. it has to use magic can mean almost anything, but if you hone in on has to use the such and such spell to do X, Y, and Z, then we have a lot more of a tangible sense of the flavor of the novel. Right, right. Um, and this brings us a little bit to genre fiction. How important is it for the author to understand the conventions of the genre that they're writing in? Because aren't there certain expectations readers bring to fantasy or sci-fi or mysteries that, again, it's not a formula, but, you know, if you don't understand that genre as the writer, do you run the risk of disappointing your readers? Yeah, I think so. I, I think so. I mean, I, I think it's I think it's very important to know what else is out there and know what your potential readers are reading. Um, not only just so you have a sense of what their expectations are, um, but also just so you can cut against those expectations. You know, I think mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, George R. R. Martin, you know, when, when Game of Thrones came out, you know, that kind of, um, he, he, you know, he wrote in a way where a lot of the surprises of um, of those novels stems from his knowledge of the way those types of fantasy novels usually unfold mm -hmm. and undermining them by like taking the archetypes and getting them killed, you know? Yeah. And so, um, <laughs> and so, you know, you can really, you can really anticipate what your, what your readership might be anticipating and use that as a mechanism to create surprises. Mm -hmm. And um, also it's, it's just so important because, um, a lot of times, when I, both when I was an agent and now in my current work, I see people saying, well, no one's ever done this before. And it's like, yes, they have. <laughs> then it's called such and such. I've read it. Um, and so you really don't want to stumble, make, make those stumbles. Of, you know, you, chances are there are people who came before you who, who mm -hmm. did, were in the zone. And that's fine. You're, you're different. You're unique. But like, know what else is out there. It's really helpful. Sure. sure. Well, and that's like, you know, the, the, the advice of you can't break the rules until you know how to write within the rules very well. Mm -hmm. Like you talked about Game of Thrones, those were deliberate choices he was making. Yeah. 
It wasn't yeah. an accident that he kept killing off his main character. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that that said, I will say that like if you need to block, if, especially when you're starting a novel, if you need to block out middle, like so, so I wrote m my middle grade um, novel. I didn't read middle grade while I was while I was writing it. I didn't represent middle grade when I was an agent, and um, I needed to kind of just be in my own head for a while as I was writing to make sure I was channeling my own voice. I think that's okay, but but then before and after, then read a bunch and make sure that you know you know who who else is out there and and um, and um, so to consider it more of a pause than than a uh, than a prohibition. Sure, sure. Um, let's see, just a couple more here. Um, we have a question here. Did you ever think about self-publishing? Are your two guides for writers? Are those? Yeah, yeah, they are self-published. Yeah, I, I did that. Um, I kind of wanted to see what the process was was like, and uh, I thought I'd learn a lot by self-publishing. So I didn't. I didn't even actually try to have them traditionally published, and um, I, it was great. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and uh, yeah, so um, I went through the process with both how to write a novel and how to publish a book um, and really thought it was pretty awesome. I liked the control, the speed, being able to experiment with pricing. Um, I just released a new edition last or year before, right before, before the pandemic, year and a half ago, maybe. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah. yeah. I've done both. Well, Highly recommend in both for different reasons. Uh, just mm -hmm. get in tune with your goals and uh, figure out what's right for each individual project. Mm -hmm. Well, and you're perfectly suited to self-publish those books because you have an audience with your blog already, and you're going to be reaching the same people with your blog as you would with the books. Right. So you could easily market to them. And I think that's so important with self-publishing. I think you do need to really have that social media presence and have identified your audience very carefully. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 you, that's the, that is the hard thing with, with self-publishing is that you have to do something to find your audience. It, mm -hmm. it can be social media, it can be online communities, it could be in-person things, if you're, sure. it could be media, it can be, you can get articles published, you know, whatever it is, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so you have to give it an initial boost. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it was my blog and social media presence. And actually, Jacob Jacob Wonderbar and How to Write a Novel have sold about the same amount of copies um, um, since they're published. So uh, both are very viable paths. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Okay, two more questions for you, and then we're going to let you go. Um, so we have a question, you know, we talked right at the beginning about write the hook, you know, identify the hook that is in your story. But we have a question, how do you create, I think what you're asking here, and it's from Anonymous, so I'm just assuming this is what you're asking here, is when you're coming up with the idea for your story, mm -hmm. how do you put a hook in that idea? And a lot of that is just sort of brainstorming and playing around with different yeah. ideas, right? Yeah, well, partly it's also just story structure, right? Mm -hmm. And so the hook that I'm, I'm um, I'm I'm basing uh, or the way I structure the the hook formula is based on an underlying essential story structure where a character uh, something happens a character goes on a literal or, or figurative quest mm -hmm. uh, they overcome obstacles and emerge changed mm -hmm. now if your novel doesn't fit that formula um, it may be trickier to write. But also, I'd have some questions about the novel because it's it's, pr it's a pretty fundamental storytelling structure, especially if it's genre fiction, um, it, it, you know, or unless it's experimental or literary or or what have you. But even then, you can you can see that those essential structures even underlying a lot of literary fiction and even very experimental work. Um, and so, if you can't very easily write a pitch, I would think about is there something about in the overall structure is my character going after uh, something do they want something uh, are they emerging changed and so i'd ask some bigger questions about your novel if you can't write that pitch mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i agree i agree and you know the the quest doesn't have to be a action-packed adventure right. quest can come in lots of different forms especially when we're talking picture books and easy readers, you know, for those young, young kids, 
a quest might be going, having a sleepover at grandma's for the first time, you know, and, and, and not, being afraid to sleep in a different bed than your own bed. So um, just sometimes people get worried about the terminology and they think I need my character to actually go on a long journey and slay dragons. Right, right. <laughs> No, it doesn't have to be quite like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it could be something, yeah, it can be something like I, to overcome a fear or, mm -hmm. um, or learn, you know, learn something new or have something right. go better. It can be an inner desire, but it sh there should be something that the character is actively trying to accomplish. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and then they merge with in a new place. And that yeah. can be same physical place, different mental place. It can be a different physical yeah. place, but uh, they emerge changed. And you got to throw obstacles in their path as mm -hmm. much as you can. <laughs> Make it <all>. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so anonymous, I don't know if you're the same anonymous, but you're asking a lot of great questions here. Can you use real names from people that existed in history in your books? I get this question an awful lot. What is your opinion? Um, so I, if they're still alive, I would be very careful. I'm not a publishing attorney, so um, please take my advice with a grain of salt, but be careful with people who are living. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see a problem per se with um, people who are dead. Do you know of any problems? I, I, I haven't, I've not heard of any problems. If they're historical figures, um, um, I, don't, I don't see the, right. the problem. And I know there's a difference between a public figure and a private person. Right, right, if right. An elected official, if they're, you know, in public, you have more mm -hmm. leeway. Um, right. But I agree, if they're still alive, you probably want to be careful unless you're writing a biography or, you know, obviously when, when you have to use their name. But I'm sure there are uh, publishing attorneys who have blogs who answer that question. Yeah, yeah. And if you're ever uncertain, just, call, you know, reach out to a, a someone who, an intellectual prop, or property attorney. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So if someone were to hire you for a consultation on their manuscript, mm -hmm. what what is involved there? Yeah, so it really varies. I, I really um, I, I defer as a writer <laughs> when I put on my writer hat. I, I, I really when I work with people, um, editors, I really want, um, um, you know, my to follow my vision, follow my instincts. And so I defer a lot to authors on what they would find helpful. So I help people at every stage of the process from initial brainstorming and, and, and kind of helping people get on their way um, to all the way to full manuscript critiques with line edits and, and all the rest. And so there are really two main times when people approach me. One is when they're feeling stuck or they feel like they need a gut check, in which case I can take a look and kind of help help through thorny issues or, or say, you know, here's where I see areas for improvement. Um, and, um, but otherwise, you know, you're on the right track or when it's a, it's as polished as the author can get on their own and they need either to me to look at the query letter or, uh, the full manuscript before they move to the next stage of the process, whether that's traditional publishing or, um, or self-publishing. So I, and I really work with the authors to kind of craft something that, that works for them. Um, so yeah. Great. And what types of manuscripts do you work on? Do you do all ages? I do middle grade and up. Um, okay. So yeah, I, I, I just didn't have an eye for picture books when I was an agent, even though I worked very closely with one of the a very prominent picture book agent, I just never had the eye for them. And so I, I, but I, I'd be happy to pass, to refer you to somebody if, if you want to reach out to me, but yeah, I, I don't work with uh, picture books and, um, and, very early readers, like kind of something that straddles early reader, middle grade, chapter books, that that, that zone I, I'm, I'm okay with. Middle grade and up, totally fine. Okay, great, great. And I assume all the details, if we go to your website, how to contact you for a consultation, all of that is on the website. Yes, it's all there. Um, make sure to check out the menu, which has, um, has, you know, it has some of my best posts grouped by writing advice, agents and publishing, self-publishing, uh, more about me if you're curious, and then the tab for getting editing if you if you want, you want to reach out to me for any help. Right. And I, I meant what I said earlier about your blog. I think you have excellent. <laughs> oh, thank you. Really thank you. And I don't know how you have time to write them all 
and <laughs> everything else. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I've been at it for a while. And what's funny is that when I was preparing for, for our conversation, um, I didn't have all this off the top of my head. I, I had to go back to my blog to, to go see what I said about these things and re to remember my old formulas and things. So it's actually really useful to have everything there um, so I could just like copy it down and remember, oh yeah, I remember, I, now I remember what it is about hooks. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, have, I don't have to remember everything. Yeah. So so it's, it's useful awesome. for me too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Great, great. Well, Nathan, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for your time and, and sharing all of your knowledge with us tonight. We really appreciate it. I know people got a lot of great information from this. So thanks for being here. On the yeah, session. thank you so much. This is really fun. Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. So remember everybody, we're, we're done until August. First Tuesday in August, we will be back and we will see you then. So have a great rest of your month and we'll see you then. Good night.